you overwhelm me. I don't know where to start. I just want to say a few words of gratitude um, for the hard work that has been taking place in Göttingen regarding the study of education and religion. This is serious work and it's continuous work. And I must admit that I've been privileged to have noted its beginnings and to have been um, extended the honor to participate in its early activities. You've really made Göttingen, you've put Göttingen on the map with regard to this particular area, and it's going so strong. I wasn't sure this would work that way, and, and I'm really, really impressed. And I thank the organizers, uh, Sebastian and uh, Yasser, for extending this invitation, for the kind words that I have heard. And let me go to Miskaway so that I don't lose time. And I must admit that I had no idea what the answer to the question was going to be, whether there was or there was not an uneasy coexistence between the historian and the philosopher in Miskaway. I first missed Miskaway in graduate school, which was a very long time ago, when I was a student of classical Arabic prose. This was somewhat unusual since Miskaway was not a stylist or a writer of artistic prose. He, however, had an association with the greatest writer of Arabic prose, namely Abu Hayyan Tawhidi, and the two participated in, a, in writing a book entitled Al Hawamil wa Shawamil. The Hawamil were the questions that Tawhidi addressed to Miskaway, the Shawamil, Miskaway's responses to them. While Tawhidi's 175 questions dealt with practically everything under the sun and beyond the sun as well, from the relationship between lightning and thunder to the skewed distribution of fortune among men, Miskaway to him, that is to Tawhidi, was fundamentally a philosopher. And thus he practically apologized to Miskaway when he asked him about why jurists disagree on about legal decisions, adding, this epistle is not the proper place for this question as it must be, uh, these questions must be addressed to jurists or theologians. But I wanted this book to contain something pertaining to the principles of Sharia. And actually, Miskaway did not disappoint Tawhidi. No matter what area or, or discipline Tawhidi's questions belonged, he found a way, Miskaway found a way, almost obsessively, to answer them by referring to Greek philosophers for humors, or three parts of the soul, or various combinations thereof, thereby making the Hawamil one of Miskaway's philosophical works. Now, what is noticeably striking is the absence from Miskaway's answers of issues related to history. This is very strange, given that Miskaway manages to juxtapose to his philosophical meanderings his views on issues in numerous non-philosophical doctrines, uh, non-philosophical areas, including Arabic language, grammar and literature, and Islamic theology, uh, Sufism and law. The reason for this absence thus cannot lie in the absence of a historical bent in Tawhidi's questions, especially that all of Miskaway's other philosophical works show no engagement with history either. The reason also cannot be Miskaway's lack of interest in and knowledge of history. For not only do we know that he studied Islam's most celebrated history, the Tariq al-Tabari, with a professor he revered, he actually was an accomplished historian who wrote a voluminous universal history, the Tajarib al uh, um, uh, that starts with a flood. He said he didn't want to go before the flood, he didn't know what happened, and ends with the year 369, which is equivalent to 980 of the Gregorian period. That is when Miskaway was 50 years old. The work has a historiographically sophisticated introduction, followed by the full citation, for the first time in Islam, in Islam actually, 
the, a, 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 a citation of the Had Erdashir, the pre-Islamic Persian classic on government, and Miskaway spent almost of his professional career as a courtier close to government circles, and he witnessed innumerable momentous historical events during the rule of the Buyids. Miskaway then was professionally both a historian and a philosopher, yet somehow the philosopher does not seem to talk to the historian. Now, obviously, there's a fundamental difference between the two disciplines, and each required a very different educational preparation. This is perhaps why, in early Islamic civilization, there are no scholars who were both accomplished historians and philosophers, except for Miskaway. The questions that arise from this unusual situation is the, and that I would like to address here is how did Miskaway deal intellectually with the difference between history and philosophy? Did the apparently un unbridgeable divide between them lead to an insoluble dichotomy in his thought? Alternatively, could we, Miskaway's readers, be wrong and that, in fact, Miskaway expressed the separateness of history and philosophy only in appearance, while in reality he saw a hidden and deep affinity between them? And if so, what is the nature of this affinity? Now, in order to answer these questions, one should ideally undertake a comprehensive uh, comparison between the two aspects of Miskaway's thought. But this is not possible. So as a first step in this direction, I will choose one topic on which Miskaway wrote both in his historical and philosophical works, then compare his views on them there. The topic I have chosen is one that, uh, that I've been curious about for a long time, and that has a palpable present in Islamic civilization of the fourth century. That's the 10th. It is, the topic is the Amma, or the commoners. I shall first present Ms. Kawai's views in his philosophical works, then specifically in the last 73 years of his history, this is 296 to 369, in which he spoke in his own voice and independent of Tabari. Now, the Amma's presence in Ms. Kawai's philosophical work is small and theoretical, but his opinion of them is clear. It is firmly negative on one level, yet accommodating on the other. On the level of mental capacity, Ms. Kawai disdainfully dismisses the Amma, considering them incapable of grasping philosophy and its ultimate aim, moral happiness. Whence his saying in that he compiled his book, the Tahdib al-Akhlaq, specifically for the lovers of uh, philosophy, not for the commoners, lil awam. And in his tainting them with ignorance in his other book, Al Fawz al Asghar, for they do not know the, the difference between prophets and clements of prophecy, and Nabi and Mutanabi. <coughs> the Amma are in fact so utterly ignorant that they believe in deplorable fallacies that intelligent people never do, such as if a person's ears buzz, people are gossiping about him. Or, when a fly enters a, people's clo a person's clothing, he falls ill. On the behavioral level, the Amma fall terribly short also. Responding to Tawhidi's query, why the, those distant from the king, such as doormen, soldiers, and stablemen, gossip about him, Ms. Kawai first identifies this behavior as natural and befitting to the commoners, uh, to the commoners' nature, that is the tibar. Then he attributes it to their wish to earn honor and standing among their peers. And therefore, they make up these stories. Ms. Kawai's use of the word nature <coughs> for the Amma is striking. It seems to suggest that the Amma cannot help having limitations, having the limitations they do. This is confirmed in other places in the Hawamil. <coughs> in explaining why human beings love the world, he presents the well-known view that people progress from being like plants, then like animals, then becoming human through reason. Except for the philosophers and the prophets, the common folks are the vast majority of the people. They occupy a station close to the beastly one, to the bohemia, with limited rationality and discrimination. <coughs> this seems to indicate that the Amma, thank you very much, 
It seems to, thank you. This seems to indicate that the Amma are not responsible for their predicament. They are born of the world uh, and their natures which with, with which they were born make them cling to the world. Ms. Kawai takes this relatively indulgent attitude towards the Amma to an even more accommodating level when he discusses the idea that human beings are not capable of living in isolation but are interdependent for satisfying their needs. Within this well-known discussion, he assigns prime importance to the contribution of groups to society. This comes through clearly in his detailed response to Tawhidi's query about the veracity of the saying, had it not been for the fools, the world would have fallen into dilapidation. After identifying two opposite states of society as cultivation and uh, uh, dilapidation, imara and kharab, to which I will return, he suggests that society is composed of essentially two groups. Those that com contribute to communal cooperative living through like agriculture, crafts and trade, and those who do not. He further identifies the first group as the amma and strikingly calls them those who cultivate the world. al qawwamu bi imarat al-dunya. He then more strikingly says it was impermissible لا يجوز, on that basis that they be called hamqa, fools, for this is unfair to those who do this with the intelligence they have. Rather, it is those who are hamqa are the members of the second group, the ascetics, the dwellers in tents, goats hair houses or reed huts in sparsely populated villages. Or they make no contribution to society and are satisfied with the most rudimentary needs for subsistence. Now, Ms. Kawai's views of the Amma as a historian is complex and strongly colored by the reality of the turbulent situation in Baghdad in the 4th, 10th century in particular, when there were numerous claimants to power from the Abbasid Caliph through rival Buyid emirs and their highly ambitious wazirs to a multitude of aspiring military and political leaders, not to mention outside players. In this climate, Baghdad was, only a theater, was not only a theater of conflict for the competing parties, but also one in which non-combatants were either ignored or trampled upon. <coughs> and with the breakdown of law and order, the institutions that belong to the time of peace cease to function. And of course, rebellions break out. It is in this context of these rebellions that Miskawe mentions the Amma. In Miskawe's history, the Amma comes through as a known quantity, since its name was used in various structures in the central government administration in Baghdad, where it's clearly opposed to the Khassa, so there's the elite and the commoners. Thus, we have the Bayt al-Mal al-Amma, the Bayt al-Mal al-Khassa, we have two treasuries, and we have two doors, and we have two kinds of halls, Bab al-Khassa, Bab al-Amma, etc. Now, although Ms. Kawaih does not define the Amma, he indicates in one text that he sees them as the lowliest class in society whose members have no social standing and who do lowly menial mem uh, labor. Because of that, he believes that the elite, the Khassa, should not physically m mingle with them. He thus criticized a wazir who, wishing to ingratiate himself to uh, the Amma, would pray with them in the mosques that are on the roads and disapprovingly reports that this wazir once even prayed with the sailors that were spotted on the strand, that's the river Tigris, of course, um, uh, in the mosque on the banks of the Tigris. Ms. Kawai's texts further clarify that the Amma was made up of mainly two groups. One, whose members were their elders, the Amathil, who spoke on their behalf with the authorities, and others who, um, uh, yeah, and others who, in, who were inclined either to be inactive and withdrawn, they called them, he calls them mastur, or active and engaged in social issues. The latter group, 
often produced subgroups that were composed of militant, armed, and criminally minded thugs who act like soldiers. Actually, he called them al mutashabbiha bil jund, which is worth investigating. These are often called in Miskaway's history by the name they are known by in other contemporaneous sources, namely the Ayyarun. <coughs> the Amma in Miskaway's text clearly constitute a large group of society, and it is this factor that makes them both powerful and feared, especially when they rise in rebellion. And by far, the most of Miskaway's mentions of the Amma deal with some form of uprising they participated in all but one of which took place in Baghdad. There's another one that took place in Rai, but one out of all the others. He also almost always gives reasons for these rebellions, thereby providing us indirectly what, we, he, what he thought was characteristics of the Amma as a social group and what he thought of them. The first set of reasons cited by Ms. Kway gives the Amma the benefit of the doubt, depicting them as deprived as a deprived entity in society, so that their rebellions seem justifiable. By far, the main reason for these revolts is the rise in prices, especially of bread, indicating that the Amma were the most economically uh, deprived group in society, one which is so helpless vis-a-vis -vis the government that rebellion against it was the only mechanism it had at its disposal to object to its decrees, the government's controlled bread prices. This is confirmed by the second reason Ms. Kawai cites most frequently, namely the unfair and normally sudden rise in taxes imposed on various government by various governments, especially in instances when the government either resorted to blatant confiscations or planted, they planted, the government used to plant salaried agents or spies which Miskaway, whom the Miskaway calls the Ghammazun, among the ranks of the Amma, in order to inform on people who had undeclared taxable commodities, which they have hidden somewhere. The third reason emphasizes the adverse role of the government versus the Amma, not for its action, but for its inaction as when it neglected to protect them from unjustifiable aggressions directed by third parties at them, as it did when the Dailamis occupied houses of local Baghdadis without uh, paying for them. The authorities stood by doing nothing about that blatantly unjust behavior. Further emphasis is provided by the next reason, for the Amma's rebellions, namely when the government failed to do anything against the crimes committed by a foreign enemy against its people. Ms. Kawai presents uh, the Amma in this case as initiating an action that the government should have initiated in the first place. This is blatantly clear in 312 in the Qarmati, this is Abu Tahir al-Qarmati's, when he attacked a caravan of the Baghdadi pilgrimage killing some and taking others captive, seizing their camels and leaving the others to die of thirst, of scorching earth or of swarms of locusts. The incident had made the Amma so angry that the wazir in charge then, Ibn al-Furat, uh, they shouted in the, they ran the streets and shouted, Ibn al-Furat is the great Qarmati. He, should, he stops at nothing at, at, to, to end the community of Muhammad. The next set of reasons for the Amma's rebellions in Ms. Kawai's historical work uncovers a darker side of the Amma, suggesting that he viewed it negatively as depraved rather than deprived. They're rash, they're open to criminal behavior, whence the more extreme subgroup among the ranks, the Ayyarun, often take the lead. One reason attributed to the Amma being is the Amma being street smart and hence quick to sense political weakness in its rulers. Its rebellions then would aim at gaining whatever social disorder allows them to gain. In one instance, the Amma made fun of a weak police chief, poor guy, he was called Najh, and gleefully invented a chant undermining him, and it goes as such, rise and care not, as long as Najh is in charge, 
ما دام نجح والي. عما is also quick to rebel when it is moved to do so by some form of factional fanaticism, religious or ethnic, as in the rebellions that broke out between the Sunnis and the Shi'is or between the Turks and the Daylamis. In several instances, other groups from outside the Amma, like soldiers and the Caliph's guard, joined one side or the other. But here, Miskawes brings in a new factor in his presentation of some of these rebellions, namely that the Amma could easily be manipulated and their leaders as easily co-opted by one or another of the rulers against whom the rebels were directed in the first place, thus making the government or at least part of it, complicit with the virulent rebels with proven criminal interest. Uh, yeah. The co-opting parties could go to such great lengths to appease the Amma that they would give them riding mules, pay them salaries, break them up into groups, each with a chief and attach to some of them to their military or security apparatus. Now, while such co-opting did, did sometimes lead to the cessation of unrest, at others it did not, as new divisions and rivalries broke out among the Amma and new animosities arose among those who attained rank recently of them. Miskawe devotes the largest space of his presentations about the Amma rebellions to two topics, th their actions and the consequences of the actions. Overall, Miskawe expresses repulsion mixed with alarm at the actions of the Amma during rebellions, calling them Qabiha, Shani'a, Qadi'a, and saying at one point that they caused Baghdad to convulse, Rtajjat. He gives these actions in strings of consecutive graphic phrases. He speaks about the reign of fear, raiding, throwing bricks, killing, robbery, looting, pillage, burning down of property, opening prisons and freeing criminals, attacking mosques, interrupting prayers, breaking furniture, stealing garments, or even rape. In all cases, it is assumed that the rebels were men. In one case, however, that of the Qarmati seizure of the Baghdadi pilgrims, Miskawai mentions the participation of women and describes their actions thus. I'm quoting, when they went out in the streets, their feet bare, their hair uncovered, their faces blackened, striking their faces in lamentation and screaming in the streets, they were joined by the widows, reduced to poverty by the wazir Ibn al-Furat. He also mentions the Amma carrying various kinds of weapons, swords and spears and so on. His most graphic description occurs in the revolt of 334 when he says prices had risen so much that people ate corpses, animals dung, even live children, and the corpses were too many to be buried whence dogs ate them. Entire houses were sold for a few loaves and uh, the broker taking some for himself, and if one had a piece of bread, he would hide it lest he be robbed of it. And men, women and children, would stand on the sides of the streets calling hunger, hunger, until they fall down out of hunger. Such descriptions and the oft justifiable reasons for the Amma's rebellions give one the impression that Miskaway sympathizes with them, which he could have. Strikingly though, this is not something he spells out in his text. Rather, what he does spell out is a sense that the Amma has gone beyond limits. And he speaks of its daring, tajasarat, and overbearing arrogance, istitala, and even calling the sum total of their actions evil. What's most conspicuous in his emphasis is his emphasis on the economic impact of the rebellions. At, once, uh, at one instance, associating with the cessation of the sources of income in qata'at mawad al-amwal, this is what explains his frequent highlighting of the plot, uh, plight of the merchants in particular. Their stores were looted, their goods rotted, and they feared for their lives and possessions, or fled their districts, or went into hiding, or became impoverished, or they were arrested, or they needed to hire guards for protection of their stores from local thugs. 
He further speaks about the effects uh, on, of the rebellions on the markets, al-suq, al-aswaq. They ceased, they became inactive, people stopped buying and selling in them, and livelihoods were suspended in qata'at al-ma'ayish, as people stopped seeking them. The end result of these rebellions is, according to Maskaway, al-kharab, dilapidation. This is a word he keeps on repeating in his text and, and section titles of his history. And when in one case, on two cases actually, he wanted you to use an antonym, he chose the word aymara, cultivation, as the opposite of kharab. It's at this point that the student of Miskaway, the philosopher, suddenly wakes up, lifts his head and yells, Imara versus Kharab. This is the subject to which Miskaway devoted two of his answers to Tawhidi in the Hawamil that I've already referred to above. And indeed, these two detailed Shawamil present us with no less than Miskaway's vision of the various states of human society. Miskaway develops his thought gradually. Human beings, unlike animals and birds, are political by nature. We all know this and cannot satisfy their needs alone. They thus resort to forming communities and cooperating with others uh, in a process that he calls polit political association al madaniya This process puts communities or societies in either one of two states, imara, cultivation, or kharab, dilapidation. Imara is achieved when, one, justice reigns among people through the power of political authority occupied by a custodian capable of supervising the people's different kinds of occupations. And second, when people work together to effect a plethora of, action, of actions and divide them among themselves. These actions are either essential, that is basic, or useful, or embellishing daruriya nafi'a and tazyin al aish Now, if political association loses one of these aspects, he means especially the first one, then it descends into kharab, dilapidation. If it loses the last two, it descends into extreme kharab, uh, that is, fi al kharab. If people live abstemious lives of necessities only like the ascetics and dwellers of sparse villages, their state is that definitely as that of kharab. Four, and here he speaks in economic terms, which remind us of his history. He speaks this way, cooperation, the life of the ascetics leads us to cooperation becoming to a standstill. Exchange ceases to flow, and every person would only obtain the product of his own labor, which is of no use to him for his bodily necessities, etc. Now, besides reminding us somewhat of Ibn Khaldun's terminology, and of course this is a separate topic, this template of human society is remark remarkably echoes what Miskaway said about the situation of Baghdadi society when the Amma's rebellions caused its descent not only into lived lawlessness, but also into the cessation of transactional and market activity, throwing people into the same state of kharab, dilapidation, he talked about from a political sociological philosophy perspective in the Hawamil. Indeed, if we are to further apply Miskaway's philosophical template and the Hawamil to the situation of society in the shadow of the Amma's rebellion in his history, then that society would be considered as being in a state of extreme, even abnormal kharab or dilapidation, as fear on the streets pushed people into isolation instead of putting them together in cooperation and political association in a state of madaniya that is the natural state of mankind. So the conclusion is that Miskaway the historian is on the same wavelength as Miskaway the philosopher. They do talk to each other and harmoniously, at least in the case of the topic of the Amma and their rebellions. Where they seem to part 
lies in the difference in nature between the two disciplines in which Mescaue is engaged. Four, theoretical, the theoretical framework for society's two states of cultivation and dilapidation stops there, as it is expected to, stating only neutrally what makes society fall into what state and when. In his history, however, Miskawe could not remain an outside observer of the momentous events caused by the Amma's rebellions. The events shook him, and he was clearly relieved when the rebellions were resolved or suppressed. Furthermore, and perhaps as importantly, Miskawe was a perpetual courtier. Of his patrons, several patrons, it is noteworthy that he was laudatory of only some. Al Muhallabi, <coughs> the Wazir, and Abu al Fadl ibn al Amid, and Adud al Dawla, not only because they were accomplished and just rulers, but more importantly because they, in addition to Mu'izz al Dawla, he has a special interest in Mu'izz al Dawla, but he was earlier, <coughs> because they lifted or attempted to lift society from a state of chaos, kharab, or dilapidation, following rebellions by the Amma and mismanagement by earlier rulers into a state of imara or cultivation. In fact, the two very long sections he uh, devotes to Al-Muhallabi and to Adud al-Dawla, respectively, ref uh, to their reforms are entitled, and these are the actual titles he mentions, ذكر الأثار الجميلة التي أثرها الوزير المهلبي حتى عمرت بغداد بعد الخراب and ذكر تعافي بغداد بالعمارة بعد الخراب After our little excursion, it is clear that the coexistence of the historian and the philosopher in Miskaway may not be obvious, but is certainly not uneasy. It's furthermore clear that Miskaway works in the two fields, uh, that his works in the two fields complement uh, each other, and hence both must be uh, consulted even in topics that seem to belong to only one of them. And thank you very much. <laughs>